Russian attacks only grow in severity in Ukraine tonight. This one caught on camera. A massive blast threatens emergency responders as they try to help a woman escape war-torn Kharkiv. The moment she's helped off of a ladder, the explosion shakes the city, sending people searching for shelter. Ukraine hanging on as the nation's capital comes under heavy fire. Russia targeting the heart of Kyiv, taking down apartment buildings. Fox News reveals a photographer and Ukrainian journalist working with him were killed in an attack. In the southeastern part of the country, more than 20,000 people flee the city of Mariupol through humanitarian corridors. The war in Ukraine is now complicating adoptions, leaving a majority of orphans alone without prospects of a forever home. The families in the midst of the process in a scramble to get the children to safety. They have so many Try to do. You're trying to give them good memories. Yes. What do they need most? I think just time spending, like being with them, is the most important. A symbol of Russian defiance. Tonight, we hear from the anti war protester seen by millions as she stormed the set of a live Russian state newscast. She talks about hours of interrogation, arrest, and what's next. A new COVID subvariant on the rise more transmissible than Omicron, and it's doubling every day. The CDC warns tonight as we try to avoid yet another surge. From high society to convicted con artists, now the woman who inspired the Netflix show Inventing Anna is forced to leave the United States. The impression these bankers are getting is that you have millions and millions of dollars in your account. If you have these millions, why do you need their money to fund your well, even the richest of people always take out loans. I was just trying to get a cheap loan. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We do begin once again tonight in Ukraine, where the capital city of Kyiv is now increasingly in the crosshairs as a city of nearly three million people is becoming a shell of what it once was. A 16-story apartment building in Kyiv is just the latest front line for a conflict that is now putting innocent Ukrainian lives on the line every day. And when the sun comes up each morning, more reminders of Russia's all-out assault. Kyiv's mayor visiting the site of an overnight bombing. For those who remain in Kyiv, sunlight is in short supply. As our Ian panel saw firsthand today, the city has now essentially moved entirely underground into subway stations that were once built to withstand nuclear war. And we learned today after that Fox News correspondent was injured in an attack in Kyiv, Tragically, his photographer and producer were both killed when their vehicle was hit. Three journalists have now been killed covering the war in Ukraine just this week alone. The attacks are now widespread across the country. Verified video shows new images of deadly attacks, a massive explosion rocking Kharkiv. In a 24-hour span, the city hit dozens of times. At least 3.2 million Ukrainians Half of them, children, have now fled the country trying to escape a conflict that they did not ask for. Our Ian panel leads us off once again tonight in Kyiv. Tonight, the full brutality of Russia's war on Ukraine. This verified video circulating online shows the relentless bombardment of Kharkiv. It was one of more than 60 strikes on a city that's refused to surrender since the start of this war. Being caught in the open in Kharkiv can cost you your life. And the capital, Kyiv, also coming under increased shelling today. The city awoke to the sound of explosions this morning, plumes of smoke rising after another airstrike, captured in this video posted to social media and verified by ABC News. At least four people were killed in the pre-dawn attack. Another apartment block ablaze, 15 stories high, and a frantic effort to reach anyone trapped inside. We can see the extent of the damage. Yet another strike into the heart of Kyiv. It's not clear whether this was a missile or a rocket, but once again, residential areas, civilian infrastructure is being targeted. Incredibly, the number of casualties still seems to be small, but in response, it appears that the mayor of the city is now imposing a citywide curfew. On days like this, the only safe place 
feels deep underground, where thousands seek shelter in subways. Many of Kyiv's metro stations are built hundreds and hundreds of feet underground. And that's because they were designed with nuclear war in mind. And that's also why thousands of the city's residents have chosen to move underground for their own safety away from the Russian bombardment. And how do you manage living underground? No, как? It's strange, the man tells me. We have no idea what's coming next. The worst part is uncertainty. Only God knows what'll happen next. And in the midst of the war, a bold display of solidarity from European leaders who braved the bombardment to come to Kyiv to show Europe's unequivocal support for Ukraine. Today, a fourth round of talks between Russia and Ukraine entered a second day. Despite optimistic comments that a ceasefire could be struck, negotiators only agreeing to meet again. And a senior U.S. official telling ABC there seems little hope for diplomacy at this point in time. In Mariupol, amid apocalyptic scenes, officials say 20,000 civilians in some 4,000 cars were able to flee through a humanitarian corridor in the largest evacuation from the city so far. But an aid convoy carrying desperately needed food, water and medicine couldn't get to residents who've been without power or heat for well over a week now. Putin's invasion has now created more than 3 million refugees in just 20 days. Nearly two-thirds have fled to neighbouring Poland. Viktor Okendo is at the Warsaw Expo, now a makeshift city of cots and clinics, even a makeshift bus station, where refugees can board for free transport throughout Europe. We're inside the largest refugee hub in all of Europe. They're currently housing about 8,000 people here, mostly women and children. This is the play area. 1.5 million children have been displaced. That means that since the beginning of the war, a child has become a refugee nearly every second. The wars claim the lives of hundreds, perhaps thousands of Ukrainians. Tonight, we're learning it's taken the lives of two more people. Veteran Fox News cameraman Pierre Zekshevsky and 24-year-old producer Oleksandra Kuchinova, who were killed while reporting near Kyiv yesterday. Despite the risks, Fox says Kuchinova was tirelessly helping crews navigate the city, gathering information and speaking to Ukrainian sources. Fox News reports the two were working with correspondent Benjamin Hall when incoming fire hit their vehicle. Hall was wounded, but the extent of his injuries hasn't been disclosed. And as the toll of this war grows daily, Ukrainian President Zelensky continuing to rally the world to his side. Addressing Canada's parliament today, calling again for a no-fly zone and repeatedly asking lawmakers to imagine if what was happening in Ukraine was happening there. His speech done, he was met with a three-minute standing ovation. Lawmakers shouting Ukraine's slogan of defiance, Slava Ukraini, glory to Ukraine. With those standing ovations for Zelensky becoming a more regular thing. And Ian Panel joins us once again from the Ukrainian capital in another strong address from Zelensky today, asking for a no-fly zone once again. He speaks to the U.S. Congress tomorrow by video. Should we expect the same message there? Yeah, I think almost certainly. I mean, Zelensky at least has been consistent. He sincerely believes that a no-fly zone would act as a deterrent to Vladimir Putin, very much as he also thought that preemptive sanctions would have deterred the invasion in the first place. But, of course, uh, you know, the Biden administration sees things very, very differently. President Biden has been clear, clear, saying that he thinks that such a move will run the risk of a direct conflict with Russia and also clear that he's not going to put U.S. forces into this war in into any kind of conflict situation. But we know that the administration is looking at alternatives. What kind of weapons, what kind of support can it provide to Zelensky that might balance the equation of power between the two? As I'm talking to you, it's very late into the night here, and we're hearing the sounds of heavy battles taking place around this city, the heart of the country, and that's why Zelensky is so adamant that he really needs this no-fly zone. And you're talking about those ongoing battles that you can hear even now. You mentioned those ongoing ceasefire talks at the same time. Is there any hope of that being possible before Russia makes a push to really try to take Kyiv? Yeah, I mean, we're 
gambling in some senses, what is it that Vladimir Putin will actually accept? Clearly, the land invasion didn't go as planned, and that's why we're seeing this significant uptick in aerial bombardments, and that, of course, leads to mass destruction and increased civilian loss of life. Um, there is a sense, perhaps, if you look at some of the targets that he struck, it's been civilian, not just civilian infrastructure, but, but sort of the military defence part of the country to try and degrade Ukraine's military capacity. And there is a thinking that perhaps that's being used to try and soften the ground ahead of some kind of peace deal. But I think if we were getting optimistic sounds, uh, little noises over the weekend from both sides, that seems to have dissipated. U.S. officials now really pouring cold water on the idea that diplomacy is going to win the day just right now. Lindsay? Uh, this is discouraging to hear, of course. Ian Panel, our thanks to you as always. And we turn now to Moscow and the anti-war protester who stormed the set of a live Russian state newscast. An editor there, she was seen by millions holding a sign in English and Russian reading, no war. After she claimed she was interrogated for 14 hours today, she was in court. Here's ABC's chief global affairs anchor, Martha Raditz, once again in Lviv. Tonight, the world's newest symbol of Russian defiance unbowed as she left a Moscow courthouse. Marina Ovsanyukova, a producer at Russia's state television, arrested after interrupting a live broadcast with this sign. Stop the war. Don't believe the propaganda. They're lying to you. Earlier, she recorded this video for a Russian opposition group. I am ashamed I allowed lies to be told on TV screen, she said. I am ashamed I allowed Russian people to be fooled. The Kremlin dismissing her protest as hooliganism. Today, she was released and ordered to pay a fine. It's unclear if she'll face further charges. Outside court, no regrets. It was my own anti-war decision. The Radichuho. In Kyiv, President Zelensky publicly thanking her and those who fight disinformation and tell the truth, real facts to their friends and loved ones. Leading Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny now facing a potential new prison sentence of 13 years, pointing to her as proof Russians are unafraid to rise up. Russia is big, Navalny said. There are a lot of people in it, and not all of them are ready to give up their future and the future of their children. 15,000 Russians have been arrested protesting the war in Ukraine. Ovsan Yikova sending this message, do not be afraid. They cannot put all of us in jail. Such bravery and conviction, they're one of several examples. Martha Raddatz joins us once again from Lviv. And, and Martha, we saw that protest inside Russia. Uh, what are your sources telling you about the morale of the Russian troops in the fight in Ukraine? Well, it certainly isn't good, Lindsay. In fact, they said morale is very, very bad among Russian soldiers. And this is coupled with a very high death rate. A senior official telling me there could be as many as 10 thousand dead Russian soldiers, although the official did say it was almost impossible to verify in the chaos of war, Lindsay. Martha Raddatz, our thanks to you, and of course, stay safe. Tomorrow, Ukrainian President Zelensky will address a joint session of Congress and is expected to make a direct plea to American lawmakers to impose that no-fly zone. Let's bring in ABC's Mary Bruce at the White House for us. And Mary, the White House making it very clear that a no-fly zone is simply not going to happen. Yet, yeah, Lindsay, President Biden is well aware of what Zelensky is going to be asking for this no-fly zone. But the White House again today said they have to consider U.S. national security here, that a no-fly zone would be seen as an escalation that could prompt a world war with Russia, stressing that they are a nuclear power. Now, we do expect President Biden to speak tomorrow afternoon after Zelensky's address, and he is expected to highlight instead the security assistance that the U.S. is providing to Ukraine, including another round of nearly 14 billion billion dollars in humanitarian and military aid. Lindsay. And Mary, we also learned that the president will be traveling to Brussels. Tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, the president next week will be heading overseas to Brussels to meet with NATO leaders. This will be their first time meeting in person since Putin started this war. Now, we don't know many of the details of the president's trip. There has been some discussion of whether Biden would find time to interact with some of the refugees who have now fled from Ukraine, uh, but no details on that yet. Stay tuned. Lindsay. Mary Bruce reporting in from the White House. Thanks so much, Mary. Thank you.
And joining us now is former U.S. Ambassador to NATO, Lieutenant General Douglas Lute. General Lute, once again, we thank you so much for joining us and appreciate your time. A fourth round of diplomatic talks now between Russia and Ukraine will re resume tomorrow. Uh, what do you think that could come from those discussions at this point in the war? Well, frankly, I'm not optimistic. Mm. Uh, I don't see a, a potential compromise between Russian goals and Ukrainian goals that causes uh, some sort of an agreement to emerge. Uh, the best case would simply be some improvement in the humanitarian situation. We got the early report from, from um, your correspondence just now, Lindsay, that at least out of Mariupol, there's at least a vignette. There's at least a small example of a humanitarian corridor that seems to have allowed some of these civilians to uh, to escape the violence. Uh, but that's about as much as we should expect in the short term. And, and we just heard Mary there talk about President Zelensky's virtual address to Congress, which is also set to take place tomorrow. He's expected to plead with the U.S. to do more to help stop Russia's invasion. If a no-fly zone is off the table at this point, what else might the U.S. be able to offer? Well, the first priority should be to sustain what we're doing now. So in this contest of logistics, with Russia trying to provide logistic support for its forces, and we and our NATO allies doing the same for the Ukrainian forces, we've got to win that contest. And that means marshalling, assembling, and distributing anti-tank systems, anti-air systems, medical supplies, secure communications that keeps President Zelensky on the air, uh, by the way, uh, food and rations and so forth, coupled with humanitarian assistance. So there's plenty of work to do. And Mary also mentioned the president's trip to Brussels in a show of unity with NATO leaders. While this is mostly symbolic, might it be able to change any aspect of this war? So I don't think it's symbolic at all. I think this is important diplomatic maintenance. The most important geostrategic advantage we have right now are the 30 uh, allies at NATO and the 27 members of the European Union. And I think it's very significant that next week when President Biden makes his trip to Brussels, he's going to visit both NATO and address the security situation, but then he's going to go across town in Brussels and address the leaders of the European Union, uh, who of course are our most important economic partners in sanctioning Russia and making sure that while Russia places a siege on Ukrainian cities, we the West will place a siege on the Russian economy. And speaking of NATO at this point, Zelensky seems to be hinting that the Ukraine may need to accept the fact that it will never join NATO. Could that be an opening that, that Russia needs to, to end this war, a possible diplomatic off-ramp? Well, of course, one of the public demands that President Putin made before the invasion was that uh, Ukrainian the potential for Ukrainian membership in NATO be taken off the table and Ukrainian be denied that opportunity. And, and the West will never accept that categorically uh, Ukraine will never become a NAP member. But in practical terms, even before the invasion, it was clear that the, the diplomacy was not right, the politics were not right to invite Ukraine anytime soon. Certainly President Putin knows that, President Zelensky knows that, and that is the clear understanding inside uh, the 30-member NATO alliance. And it appears at this point that Russia is only increasing its indiscriminate attacks on civilians. Uh, would you say that hands down what we're witnessing at this point, uh, that what we are seeing is are, are war crimes against Ukraine? Well, the campaign plan lends itself to mass casualties, mass civilian casualties. The campaign plan right now is to besiege the large Ukrainian cities. You've got the reports from Mariupol in the south, Kharkiv in the east, the capital city of Kyiv itself. And I, I believe the Russians will use mass indirect fires, that is artillery, rockets, indiscriminate fires, some fires from the air, most of the fires from ground systems, uh, and they will fire indiscriminately into these built up areas. I don't think the Russians want to clear a city of three million, the size of Kyiv, block by block, building by building, room by room. They will rather sit back on the outskirts of the city and simply shell it into submission. Who would be held responsible for war crimes, and how does that process even begin? Well, the International Criminal Court, of course, uh, is the international means by which uh, these sorts of investigations take place and eventually prosecutions take place. We, we know from the experience of the Balkan Wars that national leaders, both military and civilian, were held accountable and eventually taken to The Hague 
placed under trial and so forth and, and suffered judicial consequences. So that's ultimately the process. The problem, however, Lindsay, the challenge is that this is not quick. This typically, the investigations take years. Obviously, there's no room to investigate right now. This is a war zone. Uh, and this won't result in anything like a quick consequence. But ultimately, justice can be administered by way of the International Criminal Court. Former Ambassador Doug Lute, we thank you once again for your time. Now we switch gears to the pandemic here in this country. Tonight, the second gentleman, Doug Emhoff, has tested positive for COVID. Vice President Harris is now skipping a planned event tonight as a precaution. This comes as the CDC is warning the cases of the Omicron subvariant BA2 are now on the rise. The subvariant is even more transmissible than Omicron. Cases are now doubling every day. Our Stephanie Ramos reports. Tonight, Pfizer formally asking the FDA for emergency authorization for a fourth vaccine shot for people 65 and older, pointing to Israeli data where four shots are authorized. We asked Dr. Ajish Jha, do we know enough yet on a second booster? So the preliminary Israeli data does suggest some benefit for high-risk individuals, but uh, again, it's preliminary, and I think all of us uh, want to see a lot more of the detailed data. We want to see the experience of other places as well. Uh, and ultimately be guided by that. We also asked about the news on wastewater and the new CDC numbers on the Omicron subvariant. CDC data shows that Omicron subvariant BA2, which could be 30% more transmissible, is now nearly doubling every week and now makes up an estimated 23% of new infections. And wastewater testing and early warning system shows 30% of sites across the U.S. reported COVID positive samples increased at least 1,000% in recent weeks. What we know is that wastewater data tends to precede infection case identification that we tend to see kind of when people go get tested. Uh, and we are seeing an increase in wastewater data. By the way, we're also seeing increases in infection in Europe, obviously in other countries. And just a reminder, this pandemic is not over. Um, I don't expect a major surge or a major spike out of this. Uh, but we may see an increase in cases, and we're going to have to see where this goes. Overseas, COVID is resurging. China is battling its biggest outbreak since the beginning of the pandemic, imposing new lockdowns for 51 million people. And European countries are now tracking a new spike in COVID cases, fueled in part by the Omicron subvariant, BA2. In Europe, we've seen an uptick of cases across almost all the countries of Europe, uh, really driven by a couple of factors. I mean, one is uh, BA2, this subvariant of Omicron that has now become dominant in Europe. I think it's a bit more transmissible. That's causing a bit of an uptick. Obviously, they've gotten rid of all mitigation me measures, no masking, no distancing. I think that that creates some susceptibility in that context. Uh, and maybe a little bit of waning immunity as well. So that combination is probably the explanation for why we're seeing an uptick in cases in Europe. And concern once again, because so goes Europe. Often the United States follows that trend. Stephanie Ramos joins us now. And Stephanie, we just heard from Dr. Jha in your piece. What's his biggest concern here at home about this latest subvariant that continues to spread? So, Lindsay, Dr. Jean says what worries him the most is that so many Americans are still vulnerable. He says many more people need to get vaccinated or boosted, and that even though we wish this pandemic were over, it is not. But he says we do have the tools to manage it in a much more effective way. Lindsay. All right, Stephanie Ramos for us. Thanks so much. And when we come back, the shocking anti-Asian hate crime caught on surveillance is just difficult to watch. And tonight, word of an arrest. The fake heiress who swindled the elite is now forced to say goodbye to America. But up next, the family struggling to become whole. The children suddenly orphaned our in-depth look at adoptions during the war in Ukraine. Next. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. It was a scary time in the 70s. You had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. 
There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. <laughs> Breaking news overnight. Your money and concerns about inflation. The pandemic is not over. The stories people are talking about. You don't want to shave your legs? Don't. I was going to say. And what to expect in the day ahead. From the top of the world, baby! ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Weekday morning starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 7 there for you with one touch the abc news app download it now she was Eva. drama money and fame shaw amazing the prime housewife then suddenly we've seen a lot of things on the real housewives but we've never seen anyone be arrested unpredictable rich woman sign me up Mommy. america's number one news abc news most watched most trusted and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Welcome back. Imagine anxiously awaiting getting to meet your new child after they've found their forever family and then waking up to the news that the country you're adopting them from is under attack. That's exactly the nightmare that dozens of families in the U.S. are facing as their adoption cases find themselves in limbo due to the ongoing crisis in Ukraine. ABC's Matt Gutman brings us this story of two families and what some orphanages in Ukraine are doing to keep some of the most vulnerable as safe and protected as possible. A harrowing journey out of a country gripped by war. Yeah. We had many conversations about what was happening and, you know, if it was the right decision to go or to stay. On February 22nd, Kais and Juniper, who were both born in Ukraine with special needs, were officially adopted into the Whitbroad family. It was like, kind of like, we, we did it, we made it, we got him out, like, we're gonna be okay. Less than 36 hours later, Russian tanks rolled across the border and Russian bombs started shattering the peace. And this family from Wyoming and those kids were thrust into the biggest armed conflict in Europe since World War II. When we woke up to that concussion, like that noise, that, like, you felt it, you heard it, and then it's like, you heard it again, and then you heard it, and you're like, oh my God, like something, it's really happening. They believe they were the last parents to sign adoption paperwork out of Ukraine. Just a few hours later, clutching their kids, they joined what would soon be a deluge of nearly three million refugees navigating an unpredictable war zone to safety. It's been a wild ride. Once the bombings had happened, uh, we still didn't have their passports, so they couldn't have left. And so, like a miracle happened, and we were able to get them. They are some of the lucky ones. Prior to the invasion, just within our agency, we were working with about 45 families who were hoping to adopt from Ukraine, and they had identified 81 children that they hoped to bring home. There's just so much unknown at this point. Caius and Juniper are among the fortunate orphans able not only to find their forever families, but also to make it out of Ukraine. The vast majority of the orphans still there with no current prospect for adoption. 
The war has reportedly uprooted tens of thousands of orphans from state-run institutions in frontline cities. This orphanage in Lviv in western Ukraine had 20 orphans before the war. Now there are 105 children here, mostly from frontline cities. We visited another orphanage in Lviv. Despite the affection and the nourishing meals, there are nightly reminders of the war. At this orphanage, they're trying to give these kids some enrichment. They don't know what war is, we're told here, but they know that something is wrong. They know they're not where they used to be. You can feel the tension. Volunteers are there daily, helping with the transition and the trauma. They have some bad memories. Okay, but I can make them and I can make good memories for them. And that's what I'm trying to do. You're trying to give them good memories. Yes. What do they need most? I think just time spending, like being with them is the most important. The Ukrainian government has frozen all adoptions. Thousands of orphans were evacuated to European cities, but now the government is trying to keep many of them inside Ukraine to minimize the trauma. It's just trauma on top of trauma on top of trauma. So one of our goals is if we can figure out a way to keep them here, we reduce the amount of trauma that we're inflicting on the kids. Sherry McClurg is a clinical psychologist who specializes in adoptions from Ukraine. What these kids must be feeling and experiencing, it's got to be so overwhelming right now. And we just need to keep them all together. Spending time is something Shannon and Anthony Estes dream about in Illinois. When we first met him, he literally leaped into the arms of my wife. And, you know, he was full of tears. And then when we first got into the car, he was pointing at her seat saying, Mama and Papa, and just <laughs> immediately fell in love with the kid. Roma, seen here singing in the car. The Estes asked we blur his face for safety reasons. They hosted the seven-year-old this winter, and as they were waiting for adoption papers to be filed, Russia invaded Ukraine, upending their plans also. We didn't think anything was gonna happen. I heard Russia started to invade Ukraine. Uh, so of course that struck fear in me. I had to get on my phone, look at all the research, and I started to freak out like, now what's gonna happen? We have no way to reach him. We don't know what's gonna happen to him. But during our interview, telling us their latest news. We actually just found out his orphanage crossed into a safe country. Yep, just just this afternoon. But the Estes admit they've been fortunate. Many other families continue to wait with no end in sight after Ukraine put that moratorium on adoptions. Just to have him in my arms again and be able to hold him and kiss him goodnight and tell him I love him. Say hey, hi. Hi, my is Call my Vanuchka one more time. Uh, it would just absolutely make my day. They're worried, but hopeful there will be a day they can all meet again. It doesn't take blood to make you a family member. It doesn't even take the same language, the same culture to be a family member. Back in Wyoming, a sweet homecoming. Coming home, tell the world I'm coming. Caius and Juniper are safe from war, now a part of a loving family. Back in Ukraine, the many thousands of orphans uprooted by this war are busy clinging to a semblance of childhood, squealing with laughter on the merry-go-round, playing patty cake, zoning out to Paw Patrol, and as often as they can, being loved. I always say that um, kids belong in families. It, that's just how it is. I love you. We think we won the lottery with these two kids. So many tentacles to this war. Thanks to Mac Upman for that. And still ahead here on Prime, what does school during war look like? Our Maggie Rooley is in Ukraine and takes a look for us. Her case sparked outrage after Pamela Moses was sent to prison for voter registration fraud. Now, after a judge ordered a new trial, we'll hear from her next. With gas prices so high, where do airline prices stack up compared to other periods? We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day from the Senate that unanimously passed the Sunshine Protection Act that would make daylight savings time permanent. If the House and President agree, we would fall back and spring forward just one last time, and that is it. We shall see what happens. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. 
Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. GMA tomorrow, it's Kiki Palmer, and we're counting down to Oscar with Oscar co-host Amy Schumer live. What will she reveal on Good Morning America tomorrow? Welcome back, everyone. As signs of spring start to appear, new data shows that the spring and summer travel seasons may be ready to take off. Let's take a look by the numbers. For the first time in two years since the pandemic began, ticket sales for domestic flights in February surpassed those for the same month in 2019. That's according to an analysis of online ticket purchases by the Adobe Digital Economy Index. Travelers spent about $6.6 billion on domestic flights in February, a 6% increase from February 2019 according to the analysis, which covers data from six of 10 top U.S. airlines. The February flight spending was an 18% increase from this January, when the Omicron variant lowered travel demand. With the COVID national average now below 40,000 cases a day, airlines are expressing hope for a robust summer travel season. But with inflation already at the highest level in 40 years, surging fuel prices could drive up the cost of plane tickets and, of course, discourage some customers. Jet fuel ended last week up 19.5% from the prior month and nearly 82% higher than last year as Russia's invasion of Ukraine sent oil prices spiking. Delta Airlines president said today the airline would need to recover $15 to $20 on the average $200 one-way ticket to make up for increased fuel costs, which would likely come through fare increases this spring heading into summer travel, so it might just be best to book those tickets early. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. The suspect in custody for allegedly shooting homeless men. We have the details. The state that has become the first to pass a so-called Texas-style anti-abortion bill, but will it become law? stuck in the Chesapeake. The first to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. 
This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download Load it now. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it. Serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7", is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. Christopher Steele, the guy who picked a fight with two presidents, and he's lived to tell the tale. That now infamous dossier. Supposedly a tape showing prostitutes hired by Donald Trump urinating on a bed. It would be quite a tape if it in fact existed. I said take out the PP tape. It quickly became a question of how much of this was accurate. This is the stuff of movies. A lot of this is the stuff of movies. <laughs> Story of epic proportions. Phony stuff. It's a bunch of crap. It changed history. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. New warning signs that the U.S. could see yet another wave of COVID infections soon. The CDC reporting more than one-third of its wastewater sampling sites have seen a spike in coronavirus in the last two weeks. Meantime, White House officials keeping a close eye on a relatively new subvariant called BA2 that they say spreads 30% faster than the Omicron variant. Right now, it makes up only about 20% of cases across the U.S. In the U.K., it accounts for more than 50%. Rising concerns just days after Congress stripped $15 billion in COVID funding from a spending bill. And because of that, the White House says testing capacity could drop significantly in the coming weeks and supplies of COVID-related drugs could run low. Idaho now on the verge of following the lead of Texas with new restrictions on abortion. Lawmakers there passing a bill that would ban abortions after six weeks. The Idaho bill would allow potential relatives of the unborn child to sue abortion providers for $20,000. The state's House of Representatives passed the bill by a vote of 51 to 14 after the state Senate passed it earlier this month. The proposal now heads to Republican Governor Brad Little's desk for approval. The suspect in a string of shootings targeting the homeless in New York City and the nation's capital is in custody. Gerald Brevard was arrested in Washington, D.C. by federal agents from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, which determined the same gun was used in all five shootings of men experiencing homelessness. Two of those shootings were fatal. Brevard, who's 30, had at least one prior arrest in Virginia for attempted rape. The mayors of both New York and Washington, D.C. announced a joint investigation vowing to protect the most vulnerable. The NYPD had been warning the homeless about this suspect, offering them information on shelters for their safety. Frightening moments for a 67-year-old Asian woman as she enters the front doors of her apartment building in Yonkers Friday night. A man is seen on surveillance video walking up from behind, knocking her to the ground and punching her 125 times in her face and head before stomping and spitting on her. Police identified the man as 42-year-old Tamil Esco. He was arrested and charged with attempted second-degree murder as a hate crime and second-degree assault as a hate crime. Invest Investigators say he called that woman a racial slur as she walked past him before entering the building. Other tenants say this suspect also lives in the building. A 1,000-foot cargo vessel is being inspected for damage after running aground near the Chesapeake Bay. 
The Coast Guard told ABC News the vessel, named Ever Forward, was leaving Baltimore and on its way to Virginia when it got stuck in about 23 feet of water. No injuries have been reported and officials are unsure of what caused the ship to run aground. The investigation will tell officials if any damage has been done to the ship and help them come up with a plan to refloat it. The ship is owned by the same company that owns the Ever Given, which became stuck in the Suez Canal nearly a year ago and caused major shipping delays. The Ever Forward is not blocking marine traffic. In another sign of the U.S. trying to move back to normal, the White House says it's ready to open its doors to the public once again. After tours were put on pause due to COVID-19, the White House announced they would resume on Friday, April 15th, initially on Friday and Saturday mornings. The White House says it would closely monitor the virus and that face masks would be optional in the complex. They urge anyone who within 10 days of their tour tests positive, has symptoms, or is in close contact with someone suspected to have COVID-19 to stay home. The TV portrayal of this convicted con artist scam shot her into infamy. And now Anna Del V, who inspired the popular Netflix show Inventing Anna, has lost her battle to stay in the U.S. after completing her prison sentence. ABC's Deborah Roberts has a story. I hey, am famous. This morning, the real-life muse for the Netflix hit series Inventing Anna has apparently been deported. I painted in a public picture of me as some criminal. That's not my story. And what is your story? Anna Sorokin has spent the past year in immigration custody. A deportation order signed for her in February. Rumors started swirling today and then I hadn't heard from her this afternoon, which is our normal practice. Speaking with GMA overnight, her attorney says he's been fighting her case and that legally she should not be sent back to Europe. Traditionally, you have 30 days to appeal any orders, and then the appeal will either be denied or approved. And so if you do the math, I think we had until the 18th or 19th of this month. Infamously known as the Soho Grifter, Sorokin conned big banks and the New York elite into believing she was a German heiress with a $60 million inheritance. In reality, Anna, who adopted the last name Delvey, was found guilty in 2019 of stealing more than a quarter million dollars from acquaintances, banks, and hotels to bankroll her lavish lifestyle. Many people see you as the ultimate scammer. Are you? No, absolutely not. Her time behind bars, including 19 months at New York's infamous Rikers Island Jail. We spoke with her just as she was released from prison. The idea would be for this business to work and I would just repay everything. The impression these bankers are getting is that you have millions and millions of dollars in your account. If you have these millions, why do you need their money to fund your club? Even the richest of people always take out loans. I was just trying to get a cheap loan. Sorokin's brief stint back in society, financed in part by that Netflix deal she signed while in jail. But weeks after our interview, immigration authorities arrested her. Sorokin sharing her experience in this Insider Magazine op-ed, responding to the immigration judge's ruling, which said, the court finds that even if released from detention and ordered to report regularly to ICE, the respondent would have the ability and inclination to continue to commit fraudulent and dishonest acts. Sorokin adding, sorry, am I on trial for this again? Do you feel badly? Do you have regret? I feel like I'm just trying to deal with, uh, with consequences of my actions. Um, I was young. I would not repeat my actions. I'm just trying to make the best out of my situation. Our thanks to Deborah Roberts for that. And now to a case that we first brought you last month about Black Lives Matter activist and former Memphis mayoral candidate Pamela Moses. Moses was sentenced to prison for trying to register to vote due to what she called an error by the Tennessee Department of Corrections. Pamela Moses and her attorney Rodney Diggs both joined us now. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Pamela, I'd like to start with you. We understand that there have been some new developments in your case. Tell us where things stand right now. Well, right now, I got a new trial, thank God, and um, I'm waiting to see what's going to happen with that. Uh, there was new evidence discovered by um, a reporter in New York, and there was also a transcript turned over by the attorney general that was FedExed to the jail to me, and the 
judge that presided over the case allowed me to enter that information into the record. And as a result of that and other things, Judge Ward granted me a new trial and reinstated my, my bond. So I'm free now. And, and Rodney, this move to approve Pamela's request for a new trial is, is certainly a step in the right direction for her case. Are you confident that you'll be able to, to get her voting rights restored? Well, thank you, Lindsay. That's something that we're working on. Uh, you know, the first step is hoping that the case gets dismissed and that the district attorney's office does not file it. Thereafter, once this is done, then we're working on getting Ms. Moses' uh, rights restored. Uh, Pamela, I have to ask you this question, obviously. Do you feel that this was racially motivated? Uh, absolutely. It was some personal things, I think, because of my political speech that I utilize a lot. As an artivist in Memphis, I think it was more than racially motivated. It was just outright vindictive. And, you know, I'm praying for the district attorney's salvation because there are a lot of crimes in Memphis. And the one that I was prosecuted for was not one that should have been prosecuted. What were you feeling in that moment? Take us back to the courtroom when you were granted a, a new trial. I was feeling relieved. I really felt that God had answered my prayers and softened the judge's heart to see me as a person and not just an inmate. I was just very grateful that um, the attorney general had FedExed me the information about my previous case. That's where the transcript was located because the previous case I was also innocent of. But like most people, I entered into a plea agreement, which um, basically put me in this catch 22 where I reoffended unintentionally because they never told me my rights had been permanently taken away from me, knowing that I had political aspirations um, as a person who grew up around politics and, you know, was active in social justice and other things. I got a bachelor's in political science. The DA knew that at some point in my life I would seek public office. And so I believe that is why she gave me that previous charge of tampering with evidence. And, and Rodney, are you feeling optimistic about this upcoming trial? Well, uh, again, Lindsay, the, the goal for Ms. Moses is to get the case fully dismissed. Uh, we don't think that there should be another trial, nor should Ms. Moses have to have to sit through another trial. So the goal is to go ahead, get the case dismissed. If the case is not dismissed, then we're asking the district attorney to recuse itself and bring in a special prosecutor. And, and Pamela, just give our viewers who are just tuning in, perhaps for the first time, unfamiliar with your case, what you were sentenced for and for doing what? I was sentenced for six years and one day for falsifying a official election document, which was allegedly, according to them, the restoration form that I did not sign that I was provided with by the Secretary of State um, to office. It's a form that you know people have to have in order to get their rights back after their um, a felon in the state of Tennessee. We've tried to get that form abolished, but it's been unsuccessful here recently. And so the district attorney prosecuted me because I tried to get my rights restored. And I just think it's a tragedy that she thinks that I should be in jail for trying to get my right to vote back after I've already served my time and for charges that I was innocent of. In an interview with The Guardian, you have said that the case against you was a scare tactic in order to discourage others from voting. What would you say to others who are still trying to vote um, despite, I guess, concerns about their past? I would say, like I said to the lady yesterday that I met when I was trying to buy a old security door, some replacement, she was a business over owner over 60. And when she recognized me, she told me that she had a felony too and that she was very you know, honored to meet me. And she was like, she couldn't vote. And I was like, yes, you can. You just have to you know, go through the process. Don't let what they're doing to me scare you. And I encouraged her to do that because you know, it doesn't matter if I never get to vote again. What matters is that the law changes at some point and people are given the right to vote because we have been disenfranchised for 
many years, not for any fault of our own other than systematic racism. Pamela Moses and her attorney, Rodney Diggs, we thank you both so much for your time. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you for having me. As war rages all around them, the people of Ukraine are now grappling with when this will all come to an end. But for some children in western Ukraine, this week marked an attempt to return to some sense of normalcy as schools reopened in places like Lviv. ABC's Maggie Ruley has this story. For these kids, recess is more than a brief break of sunshine. It's a break from war. <laughs> Caught up in the conflict, school can often be the only place that feels safe. Can I come sit down with you guys? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we meet these boys on their first day back at school in Lviv. Schools across the country closed when Russia invaded Ukraine. Two and a half weeks later, many in areas that haven't yet been hit by bombings are opening back up, welcoming students that need a safe place to go, including kids that are now displaced, having fled heavy fighting back east. We were very afraid. We were sleeping and we heard bombs and in the early morning, we just took the bus and left. But we heard explosions. This boy tells me the night he heard bombs was scary. His teachers told him to pack up everything quickly. It took two days of trains and buses until he ended up here in Lviv on the opposite side of the country. The eighth graders are studying geography today. Kiro shows me home in Donetsk on the map and then his long journey to Lviv. Well, that's where we are now. At just 13 years old, he tells me it's the second time he's had to move because of the Russians. But this time, he knows he'll never go back home. Others are left waiting to hear from family left behind. This boy's mother, father, brother, and sister, all trapped in Mariupol, a city that's been under heavy attack by Russians for more than two weeks. He had one phone call from them, but nothing since. These kids have been through so much. They're all here in a brand new city. Uh, they left their home without their parents. They tell us how they heard explosions overnight. But back here, the first day schools are open in Lviv. And it's just so great to, to, to see them kicking balls, to hear uh, children screaming with joy. You know, it reminds you just the importance of kids being able to act like kids. More than a thousand kids from other Ukrainian cities registered for class on the very first day it was open in Lviv. A city inundated with families fleeing the violence. 200,000 refugees passing through here today alone. And that number only keeps going up. But as the fighting moves west, educators aren't sure how much longer they'll be able to keep their doors open for all these kids in need. At least for now, for these kids, the playtime, the friendships, and the homework is a welcome routine in an otherwise chaotic world. Our thanks to Maggie Rooley for that. And before we go tonight, our image of the day. This aerial shot shows Syrians gathering in the rebel enclave of Idlib. The 5,000 or so pictured were marking 11 years since they rose up against the Syrian government. That government, backed by the Russians, has waged an unimaginably brutal war that has left communities flattened and lives destroyed. Many pictured here said that they hope that the Ukrainian war reminds the world about the challenges they too have faced against the Russians. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, the First Lady of Ukraine speaks exclusively with ABC News while in hiding. Plus, how do you overcome an unimaginable personal tragedy? We speak with one woman who did just that. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Elizabeth Holmes found guilty on four counts of fraud, facing the possibility of decades in prison. Now, we take you inside the courtroom and behind the scenes. The Dropout, Elizabeth Holmes on Trial. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. 
This is two wives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Hi, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. The suspect accused of stabbing two women at New York's Museum of Modern Art is under arrest tonight. Authorities say Gary Cabana is seen on surveillance video attacking two employees at the museum one day after his membership was revoked. He was found sleeping on a bench at a bus terminal in Philadelphia. Police say earlier he had set fire to his hotel room. Puerto Rico is officially bankrupt-free. The island, which had long been crippled under its debt amount, to $70 billion. The massive debt accumulated due to decades of corruption, mismanagement, and excessive borrowing. The territory's debt restructuring is the largest in the history of the United States. An all-female, all-black battalion that served overseas in World War II will be awarded the Congressional Gold Medal. According to our partner station in Manchester, New Hampshire, WMUR, the battalion called the 6888 sorted and routed mail for millions of American service members and civilians. And now to Ukraine, where Kyiv is increasingly in the crosshairs, with innocent Ukrainian lives on the line every day. Many have moved underground into the subway and stations that were once built to withstand nuclear war. And as the indiscriminate attacks go on throughout the country, at least 3.2 million Ukrainians, half of them children, have now fled the country trying to escape the conflict. ABC's Ian Panel has the latest from Kyiv. Tonight, the full brutality of Russia's war on Ukraine. This verified video circulating online shows the relentless bombardment of Kharkiv. It was one of more than 60 strikes on a city that's refused to surrender since the start of this war. Being caught in the open in Kharkiv can cost you your life. And the capital, Kyiv, also coming under increased shelling today. The city awoke to the sound of explosions this morning. Plumes of smoke rising after another airstrike. Captured in this video, posted to social media and verified by ABC News. At least four people were killed in the pre-dawn attack. Another apartment block ablaze, 15 stories high, and a frantic effort to reach anyone trapped inside. We can see the extent of the damage. Yet another strike into the heart of Kyiv. It's not clear whether this was a missile or a rocket. But once again, residential areas, civilian infrastructure is being targeted. Incredibly, the number of casualties still seems to be small. But in response, it appears that the mayor of the city is now imposing a citywide curfew. On days like this, the only safe place feels deep underground, where thousands seek shelter in subways. Many of Kyiv's metro stations are built hundreds and hundreds of feet underground. And that's because they were designed with nuclear war in mind. And that's also why thousands of the city's residents have chosen to move underground for their own safety away from the Russian bombardment. And how do you manage living underground? Look back. It's strange, the man tells me. We have no idea what's coming next. The worst part is uncertainty. Only God knows what'll happen next. And in the midst of the war, a bold display of solidarity from European leaders who braved the bombardment to come to Kyiv to show Europe's unequivocal support for Ukraine. 
Today, a fourth round of talks between Russia and Ukraine entered a second day. Despite optimistic comments that a ceasefire could be struck, negotiators only agreeing to meet again. And a senior U.S. official telling ABC there seems little hope for diplomacy at this point in time. In Mariupol, amid apocalyptic scenes, officials say 20,000 civilians in some 4,000 cars were able to flee through a humanitarian corridor in the largest evacuation from the city so far. But an aid convoy carrying desperately needed food, water and medicine couldn't get to residents who've been without power or heat for well over a week now. Putin's invasion has now created more than 3 million refugees in just 20 days. Nearly two-thirds have fled to neighboring Poland. Viktor Okendo is at the Warsaw Expo, now a makeshift city of cots and clinics, even a makeshift bus station, where refugees can board for free transport throughout Europe. We're inside the largest refugee hub in all of Europe. They're currently housing about 8,000 people here, mostly women and children. This is the play area. 1.5 million children have been displaced. That means that since the beginning of the war, a child has become a refugee nearly every second. The wars claim the lives of hundreds hundreds, perhaps thousands of Ukrainians. Tonight, we're learning it's taken the lives of two more people. Veteran Fox News cameraman Pierre Zakshevsky and 24-year-old producer Oleksandra Kuchinova, who were killed while reporting near Kyiv yesterday. Despite the risks, Fox says Kuchinova was tirelessly helping crews navigate the city, gathering information and speaking to Ukrainian sources. Fox News reports the two were working with correspondent Benjamin Hall when incoming fire hit their vehicle. Hall was wounded, but the extent of his injuries hasn't been disclosed. And as the toll of this war grows daily, Ukrainian President Zelensky continuing to rally the world to his side. Addressing Canada's parliament today, calling again for a no-fly zone and repeatedly asking lawmakers to imagine if what was happening in Ukraine was happening there. His speech done, he was met with a three-minute standing ovation. Lawmakers shouting Ukraine's slogan of defiance, Slava Ukraini, glory to Ukraine. Those standing ovations becoming a regular occurrence. Our thanks to Ian for that. Imagine anxiously awaiting getting to meet your new child after they have found their forever family, only to then wake up to the news that the country that you're adopting them from is now under attack. Well, that is currently the nightmare of dozens of families here in the United States that they are facing as their adoption cases find themselves in limbo due to the ongoing crisis in Ukraine. ABC's Matt Gutman brings us the story of two families and what some orphanages in Ukraine are doing at this point to keep some of the most vulnerable as safe and protected as possible. A harrowing journey out of a country gripped by war. Yeah. We had many conversations about what was happening and, you know, if it was the right decision to go or to stay. On February 22nd, Kais and Juniper, who were both born in Ukraine with special needs, were officially adopted into the Whitbrod family. It was like kind of like we we did it we made it we got him out like we're gonna be okay less than 36 hours later russian tanks rolled across the border and russian bombs started shattering the peace and this family from wyoming and those kids were thrust into the biggest armed conflict in europe since world war ii when we woke up to that concussion like that noise that like you felt it you heard it and then it's like you heard it again and then you heard it and you're like oh my god like something it's really happening they believe they were the last parents to sign adoption paperwork out of ukraine just a few hours later clutching their kids they joined what would soon be a deluge of nearly three million refugees navigating an unpredictable war zone to safety it's been a wild ride once the bombings had happened uh we still didn't have their passports, so they couldn't have left. And so, like a miracle happened and we were able to get them. They are some of the lucky ones. Prior to the invasion, just within our agency, we were working with about 45 families who were hoping to adopt from Ukraine, and they had identified 81 children 
that they hope to bring home. There's just so much unknown at this point. Caius and Juniper are among the fortunate orphans able not only to find their forever families, but also to make it out of Ukraine. The vast majority of the orphans still there with no current prospect for adoption. The war has reportedly uprooted tens of thousands of orphans from state-run institutions in frontline cities. This orphanage in Lviv in western Ukraine had 20 orphans before the war. Now there are 105 children here, mostly from frontline cities. We visited another orphanage in Lviv. Despite the affection and the nourishing meals, there are nightly reminders of the war. At this orphanage, they're trying to give these kids some enrichment. They don't know what war is, we're told here, but they know that something is wrong. They know they're not where they used to be. You can feel the tension. Volunteers are there daily, helping with the transition and the trauma. They have some bad memories, and that's okay, but I can make them and I can make good memories for them, and mm. that's what I'm trying to do. You're trying to give them good memories. Yes. What do they need most? I think just time spending, like being with them is the most important. The Ukrainian government has frozen all adoptions. Thousands of orphans were evacuated to European cities, but now the government is trying to keep many of them inside Ukraine to minimize the trauma. It's just trauma on top of trauma on top of trauma. So one of our goals is if we can figure out a way to keep them here, we reduce the amount of trauma that we're inflicting on the kids. Sherry McClurg is a clinical psychologist who specializes in adoptions from Ukraine. What these kids must be feeling and experiencing, it's got to be so overwhelming right now. And we just need to keep them all together. Spending time is something Shannon and Anthony Estes dream about in Illinois. When we first met him, he literally leaped in the arms of my wife. And, you know, he was full of tears. And then when we first got into the car, he was pointing at her seat saying mama and papa and just immediately <laughs> fell in love with the kid. Roma seen here singing in the car. The Estes asked we blur his face for safety reasons. They hosted the seven-year-old this winter and as they were waiting for adoption papers to be filed, Russia invaded Ukraine, upending their plans also. We didn't think anything was gonna happen. I heard Russia started to invade Ukraine. Uh, so, of course, that struck fear in me. I had to get on my phone, look at all the research, and I started to freak out, like, now what's going to happen? We have no way to reach him. We don't know what's going to happen to him. But during our interview, telling us their latest news. We actually just found out his orphanage crossed into a safe country. Yep, just, just this afternoon. But the Estes admit they've been fortunate. Many other families continue to wait with no end in sight after Ukraine put that moratorium on adoptions. Just to have him in my arms again and be able to hold him and kiss him goodnight and tell him I love him. Say hi. Hi, Vanuchka. Call him Vanuchka one more time. <laughs> uh, it would just absolutely make my day. They're worried but hopeful there will be a day they can all meet again. It doesn't take blood to make you a family member. It doesn't even take the same language, the same culture to be a family member. Back in Wyoming, a sweet homecoming. Coming home, tell the world I'm coming. Caius and Juniper are safe from war, now a part of a loving family. Back in Ukraine, the many thousands of orphans uprooted by this war are busy clinging to a semblance of childhood, squealing with laughter on the merry-go-round, playing patty cake, zoning out to Paw Patrol, and as often as they can, being loved. I always say that um, kids belong in families. It, that's just how it is. I love you. We think we won the lottery with these two kids. Just clinging to those happy endings these days. Our thanks to Matt Gutman for bringing us that. And now to the First Lady of Ukraine, Olena Zelenska, the wife of Vladimir Zelensky, in hiding from Russian troops invading her country. She's given an exclusive interview to ABC News, and our Martha Raditz has the details. As her country battles to keep its independence, Ukraine's First Lady emerging as a symbol of resilience and defiance. In an ABC News exclusive, Olena Zelenska now speaking out from hiding, sending a message to Vladimir Putin and the United States, quote, only two simple words, stop war. 
Zelenska conducting the interview via WhatsApp to protect her family's location in Ukraine. <laughs> while her husband, President Volodymyr Zelensky, takes to the streets to rally his people and the world against Russia. Now, with the weight of the world on her shoulders, Zelenska demanding action, telling ABC News, Today, a friendly pat on the shoulder is not enough. Today, words of sympathy and concern are not sufficient. Zelenska calling on the U.S. and its European allies to toughen sanctions and asking NATO to close our sky or at least provide us with aircraft so we can defend our sky by ourselves. I imagine that her state is very emotional right now. She always takes close to heart everything that is happening in the country because she is also very devoted to Ukraine. The 44-year-old has become a prominent voice on social media, documenting her country's strife and rallying support for her people. Zelenska now reluctantly in the spotlight, thrust onto the world stage when her husband, a comedian, won the presidential election in 2019. Zelenska telling Vogue shortly after becoming first lady, my husband is always on the forefront while I feel more comfortable in the shade. The two met at university, joining her future husband at his production company as a scriptwriter. The couple who married in 2003, sharing this video celebrating Valentine's Day just before Russia's invasion. Now she waits in hiding with their two children. President Zelensky revealed in a speech only days after the first Russian missiles fell on Kyiv the danger his family faced. According to our information, the enemy has marked me as target number one. My family as target number two, he said. As her country faces another day at war, Olena Zelenska telling ABC News, as every woman in Ukraine now, I fear for my husband. I also know how strong and enduring he is. He loves our country, our motherland. He loves his nation, his family, me. And I know how strong are these feelings. Therefore, he will defend all these till the very end. Our thank you to Martha for that. And still to come, the horrific landslide in Peru and how to overcome unimaginable personal loss and in the process, inspire others. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. She was diva. Drama. Money and fame. Shaw amazing. The prime housewife. Then suddenly, we've seen a lot of things on The Real Housewives, but we've never seen anyone be arrested. Unpredictable rich woman. Sign me up. Mommy. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. 
Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines from around the world. Some 60 to 80 homes in a remote area of the Peruvian Andes were buried in a landslide after heavy rains caused a hillside to collapse. Neighbors like the one seen in this video created holes in homes in order to try to save those who were trapped inside. According to a local official, community members are also trying to create a tunnel in order to try to get more people to escape. The official also said that he is in contact with the president who is working to get help to the region. Thousands of protesters took to the streets to denounce the October military coup that plunged the country of Sudan into further turmoil. Security forces fired tear gas canisters and sprayed dye water at demonstrators, some of whom hurled them right back at those security forces. Tuesday's rally was the latest in a series of protests over the military takeover that removed the transitional government. Holy, the Festival of Colors kicked off in northern India today. People danced and sang folk songs during processions and frankly looked like they were just living their best lives. A holy is celebrated on March 18th. The holiday is especially important in this region, which is why they began the festivities days in advance. She made a name for herself as a media executive and creative storyteller, but a crushing loss changed the course of her life after the murder of her beloved seven-year-old daughter, Gabrielle, at the hands of her ex-husband, just hours after finalizing their divorce. Former ABC News producer Michelle Horde is here to discuss her new book, The Other Side of Yet, Finding Light in the Midst of Darkness, a memoir about unimaginable grief, faith, and astounding resilience. Welcome. Thank you for Thanks being for here. Me. Thank you so much for for sharing your story. Um, I feel like full disclosure, your friend. Yes. Um, not just a, a, a former colleague. And I just, you know, when I first got the book, I was so curious before I even opened it, just being a, a curious person, the other side of yet. People are going to wonder about that. I know that you're a, a woman of faith and, and religion. And, and so this is scripturally based, but, but give us a sense of, the other side of yet. Absolutely. So it began with the verse in Job that's very well known, though he slay me, yet do I trust him. Mm. And as I was literally leaving the crime scene um, where I lost my daughter so horrifically, I kept hearing this verse in my head. Mm. And I felt like whatever evil had caused this to happen was supposed to take me out and I, I wasn't going to let it happen. So it was a bit of a defiant, okay, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I can't imagine why this would happen, yet I'm going to continue to trust. And then over time, I realized that it had broader application. And so whether it's COVID, whether it's a divorce, we all have these losses where things just look dramatically different. And there's the definitive before in your life. And there's this opportunity to pivot and say, yes, this is true, yet I can have more, I can have a different life, I can create new opportunities for myself. And so that's where the title came from. Mm -hmm. and, and you talk about the idea that your therapist said, borrow my confidence. Yes. Explain that. You know, so many times, especially early on with trauma therapy, it just, there were days where it felt like, I, I don't know how I'm gonna get out of bed. I don't know how I'm going to keep going. And she was always so reassuring. Uh, I started writing right away um, because I've, I've always written and it felt like my way out. I had no idea I was writing a book. I was just journaling. But as I would read some of them to my therapist, she would say, you know, you have so much hope. Mm -hmm. You have so much faith. And, and it felt like, no, that's it. I'm, I'm barely keeping it together. And so the borrow my confidence was often about her being able to see the light where I was still kind of stumbling in the dark. Um, and so I held on to that throughout. And this book is obviously meant to help people cope with just supreme loss. At what mm -hmm. point in your process did you think, you know, I'm gonna write a book to, to help others through this? I received so many, I would share some of the poetry and journal entries with dear friends at the suggestion of my therapist. And I had so many people say to me, I shared this with my aunt who mm -hmm. just lost her husband. I shared this with someone else, this was so helpful. Um, after my daughter's funeral where I gave the eulogy, I had people say, I've never heard anything like that before. And so over time, it really became clear that God was somehow using these holes in my heart to shine light for other people. And so it's not about me. You know, my, my goal from day one has been making sure that Gabrielle's legacy was far outweighing and much stronger than what happened to her. The idea of letting go of the expectation of explanation. Mm -hmm. That's something that you talk about mm -hmm. in the book. I explain what that is. There is nothing that will ever make this make sense. 
And, um, you know, I went through all of the horror. You could imagine the nightmares as a mother of what if and what did I miss? But part of the borrow my confidence from my therapist was there was nothing to miss. Mm. That this was just a horrific situation that could not have been predicted. Um, there were not signs. And so how do you reconcile with something like this happening the way it happened and for the perpetrator to be who the perpetrator was? And so I had to separate in my head that the person that I knew before did exist, that what I knew as my life before did exist, and somehow that didn't exist anymore and that everything had changed. All of this for you has been so extremely personal. I think that a number of us can relate in the sense of the pandemic and mm -hmm. is COVID coming, is it mm -hmm. going, or or the the, the unrest and the, and the tumult that's mm -hmm. happening in Ukraine and, and gas prices mm -hmm. and inflation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do we challenge ourselves to get to the other side of yet? I think what's most important is it's not linear. You know, I don't believe in linear stages of grief. I believe that you're riding the waves probably for the rest of your life and you learn how to deal with whatever you had to leave behind and somehow still remain void and remain on top of the water. We, we all wanted to believe we knew exactly what we were doing before COVID hit and that we knew what work looked like, we knew what our lives looked like, we don't. And so something like what happened to me and literally what's happened to the world teaches us we don't have that control. And so the best thing we can do is control what we can and to hold on to that hope that there is always a new horizon. I have a question for you, Michelle, that I don't really know that there is an answer per se, but in the very beginning of your book, you talk about the idea of being on the beach and your daughter's footprints on the sand. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so curious how you got through that. It's not me. There, There is nothing I wanted more than to have that little girl. Um, you knew me before I had her. You know, she was the center of my universe. There is nothing that could have happened that would have been worse. I'm a TV producer. I, you know, quadruple baby-proofed everything. There was, yeah. there was nothing I didn't get except for that there was a black hole I was about to fall into. And if it was not for my faith, that allows me to walk off a cliff and believe somehow there's going to be something to catch me. I don't know what I'd, I, I don't, I don't know what would have happened. You know, I've joked and said the book could have been, you know, it's God, the end. Like, yeah. really, <laughs> really, for me. Um, and, you know, listen, people have different faiths, different backgrounds. My faith has tethered me. I think believing in something bigger than you, if that's the universe, if that's Mother Nature, if that's God, whatever that is, knowing that you're tethered to something bigger and that there can be more than whatever you see right now is, is what has kept me walking every day. What do you want people to know and remember about Gabrielle and, and now your foundation, Gabrielle's Wings? What's most important to me is she was an incredibly kind little girl. She had a great sense of humor. I think she was gorgeous. Um, she was had this bubbly, effervescent personality, but she was very kind to other children. And I heard so much of that from parents and kids after I lost her, that she was my first friend. She stopped someone from bullying me. So Gabrielle's Wings for me, which is the nonprofit in her memory, is all all about doing things for other children that I'd wanted to do for my daughter. Focusing on elementary school kids and underserved communities and looking for those gaps. If that's the gap of not knowing how to swim, if that's the gap of not having an accessible playground, if that's a gap of figuring out in the COVID area how to increase Wi-Fi bandwidth in an area where there isn't great Wi-Fi. We're looking for those opportunities that could really be game changers for children. Michelle Horde, it is just a pleasure. I thank you so much for talking with us today. And her book, The Other Side of Yet, is now available wherever books are sold. And we'll be right back. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. 
How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True Crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. All right, who needs some upbeat news? How about pressing one for a pep talk, a grade school project that has gone viral as a telephone hotline that anyone can call to get life advice from kids. Let's bring up ABC's Janae Norman for this story. It's the kindergarten art project that unexpectedly went viral. Pep Talk. Bright, colorful pictures with uplifting, encouraging messages and a free hotline for positivity and pick-me-ups. Please listen to the following options for encouraging messages. If you're feeling mad, frustrated, or nervous, press 1. If you need it, words of encouragement and life advice, press 2. Art teacher Jessica Martin and artist Ashira Wise came up with the idea for students at Westside Elementary outside of San Francisco. I want these kids to see that it's actually really easy to make a tremendous difference in the world. It just takes one kind word to bring joy to millions. From their tiny rural California community to thousands of strangers around the world and in multiple languages, sometimes receiving up to 5,000 calls a day. If you're frustrated, you can always go to your bedroom, punch a pillow or cry on it and just go scream outside. We're a grieving world right now and, and we really need to hear some really positive, optimistic, joyful words from kids. Be grateful for yourself. It just feels good to, you know, be nice to people. You just feel like you're being kind. Wise words from the mouths of babes at a time when many desperately need it. I hope that they take that with them as they move forward in their lives, that they can, in small ways, make big change happen. We could all use a bit of hope right about now. Our thanks to Janae Norman for that. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. America's number one news.